In this video, I'm going to talk about the changing attitudes we've had towards disease, especially when it comes to how we could remove disease. For most of our history, we had poor understanding of the cause and therefore also the treatment of disease. But for example, some measures of control were used in the past. Control is just the idea that they have one person who is infected and we try to make sure that that person doesn't spread it to the other people. So thereby, we basically isolate them and that, that is called a quarantine. And quarantine was used by the ancient Chinese, even before they realized what exactly caused certain diseases. They just knew these people were infected, so keep them away. And treatment was also tried by different people or different civilizations across the, our history. And treatment usually involves where you have one infected individual, and that person is given some kind of treatment, either medication or other type of treatment, basically to make them healthy again. And that was used mostly unsuccessful, but sometimes successful as well. So for example, the ancient Chinese often found herbs that would help treat certain diseases or symptoms of that disease. But overall, for most of our history, in terms of human history, we had a poor understanding and thereby poor causes, uh, poor control and treatment of disease and even worse, preventions of disease. But then quite a bit of that changed after the 1850s and that was when Robert Koch and, and Louis Pasteur came around. Louis Pasteur gave us the uh, actual cause of disease, which were often microbes, especially infectious disease. And Robert Koch gave us the cost postulates, which we could use to actually identify what pathogen caused what kind of disease. So after that, we had a better understanding of the cause of disease, which allowed us to develop better treatments and better prevention methods. So for example, the vaccines and better medication as well. But we've, overall, we've had a big shift from the control and treatment of disease to prevention and the management of disease. So remember, control and treatment were the ones I just described. Whereas management, the idea of management is if you have a chronic disease that doesn't go away, you take that individual, and you basically try to change his lifestyle or give him other advice and tips to make sure that he can live with that long-term illness but have a really good quality of life, right? So he will get new ideas and thereby basically um, stay relatively happy whilst being diseased. And also we've got prevention. The idea of prevention is basically to make sure there's no, no diseased person in the first place. And that often happens when it comes to vaccines, for example. They prevent actual infectious disease but also when it comes to just eating healthy and doing exercise, all these would be methods of prevention. So there's been a, overall quite a bit of spread from a change from control and treatment methods to prevention and management of disease. And that is due to quite a few reasons and we'll cover them in the course of this video. But some examples would be, for example, the anti-malarial drugs. These were used, especially in the 1950s, a lot to try to kill malaria, uh, sorry, plasmodium that caused malaria. But the actual plasmodium became resistant, which is why we basically, uh, they became ineffective and they became not as useful to use anymore. So now we have a focus on prevention. So it used to be treatment, which were these drugs, but now we have more of a focus on prevention, such as the vaccines, because if we can prevent it from occurring, then we don't need to worry about the resistance that develops. And that saves us lots of lives and money as well. Right? So we've got more of, a, more of an actual focus on prevention nowadays. Same when it comes to plant diseases. So for example, we used to focus a lot on, on pesticides. So if, for example, there's one actual um, pathogen or plant here which is diseased, then it could spread the actual disease. But if you use pesticides, they'll kill pests and pathogens. So thereby killing these actual microbes that might be infecting that, that area. And that thereby controls disease. So if one is diseased, it doesn't spread to other ones. Nowadays, we're trying to develop foods which are resistant to begin with. So, for example, some GM foods, BT crops and other foods or plants that are resistant to begin with, which means they're not going to be affected by those pests. And thereby, it's basically the idea of prevention as opposed to control. Pesticides control, whereas the GM foods would be more of a prevention method. So we're trying to shift more towards um, prevention in that case as well. Again, saves money and saves problems that arise due to pesticides resistance because the actual pathogens and pests can become resistant to pesticides as well. But that was just some examples, and we'll go for a couple more as well. But one of the reasons why we do need to make sure we have good, uh, good measures of controlling disease and treating disease and preventing disease is because we've got lots of different types of disease affecting plants and animals. So for example, if you go out into the garden and you just look at different types of plants, you'll be able to find lots of infections, even in your, in your common garden plants, such as, for example, the fungal plaque spots. So you can see the spots here, the black spots here. These are signs usually of fungal infections. You can see we have mosaic viruses that cause these nice patterns in actual plants as well. While they look pretty, they're diseased because of they're caused, a, caused by a virus infection. We've got bacterial blight. Blight is often caused by bacteria, and that just means that we have 
part of the actual plant has died off. That was due to bacterial infection. And this is a leaf miner. So this is an actual parasite, a worm, that just eats through, like mines, or eats through the actual leaf. So the inside of that leaf is hollow. So all these would be examples of pests or diseases that affect plants in Australia. And if, for example, especially our crops, the crops are the ones which we guard the highest, because crops is where food comes from, or other um, things we make from these plants, which we use for money purposes. So, for example, if there's one infected plant with any of these infections or other infections, again, this is where we use these pesticides to make sure that these infectious, infected, infectious organisms die off. But yeah, the problem with pesticides was that mainly that it, it, first of all, can damage the environment, and also that they can become resistant to these pesticides, which means we need to develop new pesticides, which cost lots of money for them to be able to be effective next time. So this would be a measure of control, but it's not super effective. But nowadays we focus all on, on quarantine as well, especially in Australia, where we might prevent certain things from entering Australia, and thereby prevent the actual entry of new diseases which we might not already have in Australia. We do have lots of diseases in Australia, but some of them we don't have. One would be, example, would be the fire blight disease, which is a bacterial infection that affects apples. And this Australia, New Zealand is affected by this, but Australia isn't yet. And our quarantine measures make sure that it doesn't spread to Australia, prevents the entry. I'll talk about actual quarantine a bit more in detail now, because what the idea of quarantine is, is basically we've got two types. We've got the idea of something preventing the entry into Australia, or if something is already in Australia, we're trying to control the spread across Australia. So we either have prevention or control, so quarantine can do both. So for example, when it comes to preventing something in terms of entry into Australia, we've got the airports that have quarantine measures and the ports, so our actual um, shipping ports, so water transport mechanisms. And these are controlled and they're, they're the quarantine agents. And what they do is they check, for example, to make sure that people don't put in fresh fruits and vegetables, no soil, no plants, and no animal products, especially the ones which are unpackaged or un, uh, unsafe, possibly, because all of these actual products may contain pathogens, right? So we just, what we do is we have, we that just basically don't allow them to be entered in Australia to make sure that these diseases that might be in these, in these actual different products don't spread into Australia. And it's been relatively successful, quite successful, because, for example, we have uh, prevented the spread of the mad cow's disease, which affected the UK, so that's England mostly, quite badly, but because we didn't allow any actual cow products to enter Australia, we prevented the spread from mad cow's disease from Australia, uh, from the UK into Australia. And same with the fire blood disease, I mentioned that's from New Zealand, and, and that's basically affecting quite a few apples there, but we're trying to prevent that entry from New Zealand into the apples from New Zealand into Australia, thereby preventing the spread of the fire blood disease as well. And we're more or less successful with both of these, so we have not have any many of these cases because of our effective quarantine measures that prevent entry into Australia. And also, again, when it comes to control sort of spread across Australia, we have either, for example, we might quarantine affected people or animals, and the equine flu outbreak would be one example of that. And also we have these infected zones where we have basically make sure that food products or other things don't leave those infected zones and spread across the actual um, border, right? So thereby leaving that infected zone and not widening it. So for example, we may have, we may not, so certain things may not leave an area, especially if they're sick, for example, the equine flu, or you may not bring food across certain areas, especially if that comes from an infected zone. And the food fly was an example of that. Because we've been actually relatively successful in controlling the spread of disease, especially when it comes to uh, fruit fly infections. Fruit flies infect uh, parts of Queensland, but they haven't left too much of Queensland and haven't um, come over to New South Wales in any big numbers because we have basically these border guards that make sure any food that comes from Australia across, across the border, so from those infected areas into um, New South Wales basically has to be thrown away to make sure it doesn't spread disease. And also we have these problems of equine flu in the past that was imported from overseas. These animals brought in equine flu. Some have got through our borders uh, prevention methods. But then once it got to Australia, we had effective measures in terms of quarantining those animals and people who were um, inf affected by the equine flu to make sure that the actual disease doesn't spread outside of that area that was affected. Right, so these are both examples of how the control of spread across Australia has been quite successful. So if something does end Australia, that we've been successful in making sure it doesn't spread any further.
And one thing, more thing I want to talk about is just our overall attitude towards our general health. So we've had more and more public health programs, which are government funded mostly. And these public health programs basically promote the prevention and management of disease to make sure that the cost is lower cost. Because the less treatment we have to have, the lower our cost. And also the less um, treatment we have to have, the less our disease progresses, the more healthy we feel and the better our quality of life as well. So we used to always focus much on treatment. So for example, for heart disease, which is caused by a plaque buildup in the, in the actual blood vessels. So coronary heart disease, you get a heart attack eventually from the actual buildup. And we used to always have surgery. Um, so people who have are in late stages, we would give them surgery to give them new unplugged vessels so that they, their heart could function again. And we would also give them medication basically to lower their blood cholesterol so to remove this again. So these were performed the treatment which we still have nowadays, but we have more and more of a focus on health promotion, so on the prevention and the management, which would be, for example, having a balanced diet. Having a balanced diet would, first of all, reduce this buildup of plaque over time, so it will slow that down. And also, if you do have the disease ready, it basically gives you more time for it to become dangerous and damaging. Right? So it's both good for prevention and management, and so is having regular exercise. So it helps you prevent the disease by reducing that buildup of plaque. And also, if you do have it, it prevents the delay, it delays the actual onset of symptoms because it will take longer for it to become cr critical, right? So at the moment, we still have treatment, prevention, and management technique when it comes to heart disease, but we're putting more money into prevention and management because it will lower the costs for the taxpayer and also it will increase the quality of life for the people who might be affected uh, of the actual disease. Uh, so this was just a, a quick overview of some of the actual concepts that I covered in the next couple of top points. But hopefully this was a good insight in terms of what will be coming.